Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for tuning in to another live session. Today, uh, we have one of my, I think, favorite B2B marketing topics on the agenda. And uh, we have Andy joining, which, Andy, I think I've been following you for four years now on uh, on LinkedIn or, or something like that. Uh, I think initially we wanted to try to sell to, to lead feeder while we were back there. Uh, but uh, yeah, I've seen you've been extremely active on sharing a lot of good insights uh, on the, on LinkedIn all these years, and really happy you wanna wanna join me uh, today. But before we get into the topic, I think maybe besides me, then I think for people listening, it would be cool to hear kind of the the short intro to to your background and why you know something about this topic which we're about to to discuss. Cool, sounds good. Yeah, you're assuming that I know what I'm talking about, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I could be just fabricating the entire Slightly. thing. Uh, <laughs> no, I joke. So, so yeah. So, just a background on me. So, um, my name's Andy Culligan. Yeah, I've been I've been in B two B marketing now for oh, many years. Uh, so, I finished uni in two thousand and eight. So, since then, so whatever that is. So, uh, <laughs> so fifteen years, sixteen years. It's pretty um, much the same timeline we're running on. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> so, so I, yeah, so 15, 16 years I've been in B2B marketing myself, but I've also been prior to that when I was going through uni and also I started working actually when I was 14 doing like marketing and sales type of stuff anyway. So, um, I've always had it in my blood, let's say, but, but, um, I started my career though as an SDR. So, um, I studied marketing, then went to be an SDR and then I went into account management. So into selling and then Moved away from selling into marketing because I wanted to earn less money. It's a joke. Uh, so, so it's not a joke that I earned less money. I didn't earn more money, but I, I wanted to go into marketing. So went into marketing um, after coming, like, my, started my career as a seller, you know. Um, and during that time, I just really recognized, like, what's needed from a sales perspective from marketing. Like, what 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 the expectation is and and how you can help a seller sell right and i'm also like i, I am a seller right like I, it's mm. in me to sell like i've always done some form of selling like i've done things like selling gym memberships on the street in december in dublin and being just paid on commission right so like i've done all the shitty selling jobs right i've done them all like name one i've done it i've worked on a rodeo <laughs> ball i've worked on a trampoline i've worked on a i've worked on a bungee jump like all these different things were just come on, come on, jump on, let's go, let's go, let's go, you know. Yeah. So I've I've always had that in me. Um and then I, I as I went into the marketing world, I got more into marketing tech. So I then became very familiar with Marketo back in the early days, right? Um, and became a global champion for multinational for Marketo. So then like it was really like had a deep understanding of marketing automation platforms from about 2009 or maybe a bit later than that, 2010, 2011 onwards. Um, and that's really in the early stages of marketing automation, right? Stuff was coming around the early 2000s, but stuff started to explode around lead generation, demand generation, yeah. et cetera, probably around like 2010, 2011. That's when I really got my hands dirty and that type of stuff. Um, and with that, then I was very heavily involved in lead gen. Um, and with that, then I, it meant that I had to work very closely with sales teams. So I did mm. that at a multinational. Then I went into the tech space after a couple of years in there. And in the tech space, everything just speeds up, right? So you go from being in a sort of slow moving, slow paced environment where I was previously, which was a, a company that offered private communications networks for like police forces and armies <laughs> and, you know, to like going and working for Imarsis, which was just bought by SAP recently, but their marketing automation platform for retailers, right? So I went from this like really slow paced sort of old white man industry to this like crazy diverse like head rolling quick sort of industry where everything needed to be changed immediately and decisions need to be made yesterday and um within that then I, I just it just sort of came second nature to me being like well i need to get sales bought in on this otherwise like if i'm bringing mm -hmm. stuff in like yeah. lead gen wise it's just like if the like the feedback you're gonna get is the leads are shit like even if you're bringing in top class leads unless they're like requested demos um then it's going to be like like they're going to tell you that the leads are shit like you can have IC, <laughs> icp like ideal customer like top profile like yeah. that person's after coming in watching a webinar and downloading two ebooks but they haven't come in and said shut up and take my money so therefore the leads are shit so yeah. like sorry, I've heard, 
five times already. So my yeah. apologies if you weren't expecting that to happen, but sorry. Yeah, parental <laughs> advisory. <laughs> exactly. But um, so like I, I always found it like getting close to the sales team helped me there being like, um, okay, guys, this is like a little bit like a touch, a touch, touch warmer than cold. It's not like, it's not like these yeah. guys are saying like, shut up and take my money, but we need to warm them up, you know? Yeah. So then I obviously got closer to SDRs as well. And over the years, I've managed a number of SDR teams under me. So I've, I've typically brought marketing or brought SDRs under the marketing team and used them as like the first wave of attack. That's mm. a hard world to, word to use if you're talking about going after prospects, but the first wave of communication, yeah, totally good. you know, um, and uh, I find that works well within the marketing piece as well because you get them well connected into the lead gen engine or that demand generation engine. I see SDRs as being a core function of driving demand. And mm. right now, as an example, I've, I've been running an SDR team for the past year and uh, the fruits of their labor from last year are starting to pay off now. Whereas mm. with marketing stuff, it doesn't it doesn't have as much of an impact as an SDR team does, right? So I think that people are looking at the SDR position in a wrong way where they're very like we need to book a meeting tomorrow if you don't get your meetings booked you're fired whereas mm. actually if they're doing a good job and they're getting the message out there in front of people and keep on tip and tip and tip and tipping away yeah, yeah. at those people then you'll start to find that the the message will resonate over time when the need becomes when the, when the need to buy a software like what you're offering comes into play right and i'm seeing that now with a team that i've worked with i've, I've gotten a, a couple of younger guys involved in being sdrs and the outreach that they started exactly a year ago is now transforming into ICP booked meetings mm. at an event that we're going to in three weeks' time. And yeah. top, like high, like CMO level of like multi multi billion dollar organizations meetings getting booked, which was yeah. a pipe dream a year ago. But the fact that yeah. constant follow up, constant this, constant that, coming from the SDR team rather than yeah. just like sending ebooks and doing webinars and all that brand stuff, fine. But actually, that connection has been made with the SDR. It's one that's pushing forward. But, but my, your question was like, how do I, like, connect myself to this marketing and uh, marketing and sales act, uh, alignment piece? Is that, like, everything that I do is around sales and marketing alignment. Like, yeah. so I, set, I set up my own business now, and I work with many different companies, um, advising them with their marketing and sales strategies. And I spoke with somebody yesterday, and I like, I could see within seconds that this person like doesn't speak to their sales team. I said, I was head of marketing. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Um, do you uh, like, how often are you, or the question asks is, how many SDRs do you have globally? Uh, three, I think. Where are those SDRs based? Germany and the US, I think. Uh, okay. <laughs> so I was like, okay, so how often do you speak with these guys? Oh, never. I was like, okay, I, I could have told you that the moment you opened your mouth. So like, it's if you want this work. to work, yeah. if you want this to work, you need to go start talking to them. Right. So, yeah. So like Maybe just yeah. putting in a small break here. And so, sure. uh, Sultan is asking, you're recording this two lads, right? And, uh, yes, the, uh, the live will be available as a recording. So if you're in a meeting Sultan, you can, uh, you can catch up on it, uh, on it later, but yeah, for anybody uh, listening in, you would just, you know, feel like you're a part of the conversation and just write in the the questions and I can I, I'll try to force Andy to pause and uh, sorry <laughs> and to answer the questions uh, as well um, where do we start uh, I think actually it's, it's a good to kind of go down the anecdotal road of why it's bad when sales and marketing is not aligned uh, which is kind of what that's kind of the worst situation. And I think just to 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 sit to warm you up, uh, I think the way I think about this topic is that like your company can only spend its money once, and if marketing is spending the money like running in one direction over here, and the sales team is running in the other direction over here, then all the money that is being funneled into these two teams is not being used to as much uh, impact as it could be. Is as if like if everybody were spending their time and money on the same types of accounts and people and so forth. Sure. So I, I think there's a, there's an additional element with that. If they're running in different directions, this is something that I've seen quite often in that, um, with that split, you see sales going and creating their own messaging, et cetera. Right. This is a big, this is a big problem. I see sales teams, sales development teams. So SDR teams, if they're not getting, the feedback from marketing or given like things around like who is our core persona? What is the mm. messaging around those personas? 
uh like what is it what are the needs for these particular personas how do we scratch that itch that they might have right um then you end up like with marketing going off and creating marketing messaging which is over here somewhere right and then you have mm. salespeople or sdrs going off and creating their own message over here somewhere so actually the product that's being sold by the marketing and the sales teams are almost like two separate products which can happen very easily right yeah whereas a simple example would be I uh, worked with companies in the space of um, customer uh, data platforms, so CDPs. Right? Yeah. Um, and you've got one side of the one side of the coin, people saying, "Hey, we're a, we're a customer data platform or a CDP," and then you've got other people selling it as a CRM <laughs> in the same company. So like Perfect. they're actually they're actually two different tools, right? So yeah. and that's just confusing for the prospect more than anything else. And that probably even thing. speaks to like like some parts of the messaging need to be approved by the product team or at least like some kind of product marketing fun function that's gonna be responsible mm -hmm. for activity rates and churn of the product, etc. So if you're saying one thing but the product does another thing, you know, you're bound to have unhappy relationships with the customers at the end of the day. 100%, 100%. Cool. Where can we, can we try to kind of, uh, what would be the typical places where people end up being misaligned, maybe just to start there, and then we can move in on kind of what, what is the better way to, to fix these misalignments? Sure. But, uh, yeah, so wh where do you see the typically go wrong? Uh, uh, is there two departments here or is there more departments like marketing and sales or is there more departments that we need or roles that we need to consider here? Uh, I think so. I, I think where the common misalignment leads to or it's the common saying, you know, the, the fish always stinks from the head, right? That's the, have you ever heard that saying before? It's, no. an, Italian, it's <laughs> an Italian phrase, right? But it makes sense, right? So the the hit the fish starts to sting from the head and then the red, like that's the first thing to start rotting and then everything else rots afterwards right yeah so so uh, <laughs> the if if the heads of those apart departments are not aligned or they don't see eye to eye then you're ultimately yeah. going to see problems amongst the rest of the team um and i've seen it across numerous organizations in that you have a cmo and a chief revenue officer that don't see eye to eye or they have arguments about x y z and yeah. that then trickles down amongst the teams and then what essentially what you need is everybody to be talking to one another but if those two at the top aren't and they're causing barriers between one another that starts to trickle down to the next layer mm -hmm. layer below that etc cetera, etc cetera. so the number one misalignment issue there is is that the the top two don't talk to one another or yeah. maybe they don't see eye to eye it's most likely that it's not normally there it's not nothing to do with talking with one another most of the time if you're talking about a sea level structure right yeah. Um, but that's like in in that in that case, let's say let's assume there's a chief marketing officer and chief revenue officer. Yeah. In yeah, that yeah. specific example, you're probably going to see the fact that they just don't get along, and there's arguments about X, Y, Z, and then it's up to it's up to the CEO to try to fix that or try to <laughs> try or 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 the rest of the C level to try to get that working properly. Come on, kids. Uh, no. Exactly. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You know, play yeah. nicely. You know, that's. That's the thing. But if, if you're talking, and this also also happens quite often in the startup world, whereby there might be a chief revenue officer or there might be somebody that's seen as like a more senior person in the organization that's higher, handling mm. sales, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then they just hire like a junior-ish marketing manager. Mm. That junior-ish marketing manager, mid-level marketing manager is not talking to that head of sales and therefore no. it's not working. So you need to have people two, two layers of eye to eye, right? Mm -hmm. so yeah and i think you know if you go down into the details of, of what can go wrong then i had a few weeks back i was speaking to one of our customers that um, was looking at i'm actually from this linkedin campaign generating quite a good amount of leads but none of these leads moved into sales opportunities and then i started asking this question well what happens to the leads do you know if the salespeople call these people? Do they write them? Do they follow up on these leads? And then she was actually not quite sure. Like they took them through their kind of marketing automation. Then she expected the sales team to actually be jumping on these leads afterwards. But you know, she didn't know what what came out of it. And I think that's a classic. I think it's also 
markets just needs to to get themselves together and understand what what b2b marketing is about <laughs> and that is about your company selling more so you need to think kind of full funnel or holistic about whatever marketing activity you're doing which is kind of Yes, you're doing something in your silo, but what does it ultimately end up uh, becoming afterwards? Sure. Yeah, I th I think is with that it's it's uh it's an ownership issue what you just put there as well, and I'd always put the ownership on marketing, um, uh, to to make sure that stuff is being handled right. So, like I've been with so many organizations where the marketing team are giving out about the sales team being like. Uh, you know, we've been bringing in so many leads and they haven't been following up with any of them. And I'm like, well, what have you done about that? You know, have you addressed it with the sales team to say, hey, you know, first of all, can you follow up with these? Second of all, if you're not following up for them, with them, is there a reason why? Right. Like, yeah. are they are they actually shitty leads? Like, is that actually the case? Are they bad? Could be. Right. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. It could be that they're not they're not good or that they're, they don't know how to follow up with such top of funnel leads. Like Stefan, you just mentioned there, LinkedIn leads. LinkedIn leads are typically like lead gen ads, right? Yeah. Where somebody has gone and like in exchange for an email address, downloaded a piece of content, whether it be yeah. an ebook or whatever it might be. Now, yeah. as I said to you at the start of this call, like they're just like slightly warmer than cold. Yeah. Like it's the difference between a seller picking up the phone and being like, Hey, this is Andy calling from andyculligan.com and then getting the email, getting the answer like who yeah. from where. It might be like, oh, who? Oh, yeah, but I, I know andyculligan.com because I downloaded a piece of content, but I have yeah. no idea what you do. Yeah. So, like, again, it's just a pointer in the right direction. Like, and I always say this to sellers or SDRs, it's setting expectations also from the marketing side. Like, would you prefer to just go completely cold all the time and research all the accounts yourself? research all the contacts and just go chase those? Or would you prefer those people that you're doing all that research in to have contact points with our company before you get in touch with them? And I think the 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 answer to that is always going to be the latter. Of course, I want interactions. Well, then that's exactly what we're doing from a marketing perspective, right? That's the, mm. And that's setting that expectation because a lot of the time they're expecting demo requests. Yeah, Hit me with waves of demo requests. Where yeah, are the yeah, people no, telling me to shut up and take my money? Exactly. No, it's no. not how it works. So. Um, we can pull in a question, which I think is also relevant here uh, from Vishal. He says, uh, for a small company with two or three people working uh, and trying to acquire clients, how can they align marketing and sales? And I think there's probably also a perspective here. Here is kind of when you're super small like this. How do you align? And I don't know how big companies you've worked at. Um, and I've only worked up to how many were we there? Like a couple of hundreds of people. So may, I don't know if you've seen the above uh, above that as well. But if we start with Michelle here, like if you're two or three people, how do you align? So I've worked. So to answer your second question before the first is, I've worked with companies from ten people up to tens of thousands of people. So I've yeah. I've got a good mix there. Um, so to answer that question, Vishal, is, is it, it always starts with talking to one another. Again, you're like, oh, duh. Yeah, you know, like, but it actually does. Like, so it yeah. means like getting, making sure that you have a regular catch up with whoever is, is uh, on the sales team, right? So, and I'd also be during that call, you, I, I normally structure, this is my playbook, right? But I normally structure it in it, looking at opportunities that are being brought in on a weekly basis and trying to understand those opportunities where did they come from right it might be hard to try to to try to figure that out but if you don't use a marketing automation software which you don't have to by the way so you might be like oh that mm. sounds expensive we need to implement hubspot we need to do we need to spend a lot of money you don't right and mm -hmm. um, if you can try to figure out where these inbound starting with inbound or outbound whatever any opportunities that are coming in to your business like what is the source of those how are they coming about is it directly from a seller is it, is, it, is it something that's coming to the website? Are they one of those demo requests, for example? Mm. Are they picking up the phone to you and calling you, right? And digging into that on a, on a weekly basis is typically how I've done it before in the past, alongside the seller, so that we're both understanding where this is coming from. And if it's leaning yeah. more in the favor of sales to be like, sales are doing all of the, all of the sourcing here. So they're do, like, everything has been self-generated by sales. Then you need to sit down and figure out, okay, how can I help support to bring in like attract more 
Mm. right depending on what your business model is it might be a small company for two or three people but i don't know who you're chasing vishal maybe you might be able to make that a bit clearer in the comments what you guys are selling and what the what the typical deal size is um but there, there are many things that you can do as a marketer to try to support that and you discuss that on that call with the seller and say hey look let's let's try to get there where i'm able to support you so that i'm able to bring in more of this stuff so that it's not you guys doing all the self gen yeah, I think, uh, and maybe maybe a tool uh, which at least at our company has been incredibly good to, or a process to go through, has been to really define an ideal customer profile, like to agree upon marketing and sales and product. Who is this product for? Mm-hmm. So that when we do marketing, we try to uh, attract the kind of companies and personas that we've agreed. The sales team spends their time on this persona and the product team keeps building stuff for this persona. Then even though you don't talk together every single day, you have still agreed. Mm-hmm. This is kind of the, at least the, somewhat the framework of who uh, we should be going for. Sure. Vishal said it's a, it's a marketing agency. So if it's, it is, same goes for a marketing agency. If it's, if it's uh, two to three people that are in the sales team that are looking to acquire, then I, I would say just follow that process. As Stefan just said, like if you know what your ICP is, if you don't, you need to go define it because then otherwise you're just chasing your tail. Really, you know, you don't know what to target. So define what 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 a good customer looks like, um, and then figure out like where your current business is coming from and how you can help support it from a marketing perspective. But the thing is that marketers are, and I'm a marketer, so I can say this: marketers are typically like quite. Uh, sensitive about like no sales need to organize this and they need to push this they're not going to organize it this is on marketers to go get this organization on like marketing and sales alignment happens from marketing it never yeah. is never pushed <laughs> from the sales side i'm sorry yeah, but it is just and, it is what yeah. it is it's a it's it's yeah. the bitter truth right <laughs> yeah no it is like i think there's a lot about proactively taking responsibility for this. And I, I would wish that salespeople would walk into like physically or digitally into the marketing room saying, these are the best kind of leads, give more of this. Uh, I need this flyer, to feather, P- PDF download, whatever. But it's uh, in nine out of 10 cases, it's not going to happen. So you as a marketer need to like step into the room or buy them a beer or sit next to them at lunch. So like get to know them and l- listen into like, do you like the emails that we collect for you? <laughs> do you like the demo calls? What can we do better or worse? Uh, like be proactive about it because sales B2B is just about selling more. <laughs> yeah. Get close to them. Get close. Like, Stefan, you hit the nail on the head there, mate, when you said like, you know, buy them a beer, bring them for lunch, do whatever. You just get close. Like uh, there's, it's, it's the only way to create a relationship because if you create the relationship, then you create a trust as well where they're, they're also because what happens often as well is that sales end up throwing marketing under the bus when they when they don't start when they're not performing right yeah <laughs> like oh it's, if only I got more leads I wouldn't be ninety five percent of my pipe I wouldn't be behind by ninety five percent of my pipeline target for the queue right yeah so I, I, I the closer you are there the earlier you're able to come up, like figure out ways to 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 fix those issues but it's it's work right it's not going to mm. naturally happen you need to you need to work on it and. It needs to come from the marketing side, unfortunately. So to okay. everybody who's listening from a marketing perspective, it's up to you to create the alignment. Don't expect the sellers to do it. A good one. Yeah. When you start with a, working with a new company, uh, Andy, what do you do then to like, uh, of course, you have a lot of experience now, so you can sense it. But kind of what is the practical things you start looking into to, to discover whether there's an alignment or not? Yeah, I mean... As, as I said to you at the start, it's relatively easy when you see it because um, like you just talk to one person from the sales team and speak to one person from the marketing team. And I always ask the same question is um, like, how often do you have a, how often are you speaking with somebody on sales work or how often are you speaking with somebody on the marketing work? Mm. And quite often, quite often you hear, oh, like, uh, I mean, like, once or twice a quarter or a year or whatever and sometimes it's like well i meet the sellers when we go and do our yearly meetup somewhere and we have a few beers Mm. together and then that's it you know and i like with that i'm automatically like okay there's no sales marketing alignment here there's no like and typically as well if you go and speak with a seller 
they will always say, oh, you know, like either, either they, they, they say two things. They say marketing here is not great. Like we don't really get too much support from marketing. They'd be pretty, they'd be open and honest with you immediately. Yeah. Or they say our marketing is awesome. And if the marketing is awesome, I'm typically not brought into the organization. So like, <laughs> you know, so <laughs> I can be pretty certain that if the marketing is not going very well, there is lack of sales marketing alignment anyway. Yeah. The sales are not getting what they need. The, the marketing is not providing what's needed to push the company forward commercially. Now, in saying that, that doesn't always mean it's the case that sales are being on their best behavior either, right? So, yeah. Cool. Uh, so, Ina is uh, asking us a question here. Um, could you please talk a bit more about trying out different channels and options from both marketing and sales side and how to align on those strategies? Ina, what, what type of company are you working for? Where are you, where are you focused? Like uh, Vishal mentioned before, they're a marketing agency. What are you selling? We'll give her just a second. Yeah, I, I can just warm up. I think like also what you're getting at, Andy, is also, is it really big accounts that you're going for or is it the smaller accounts that, that we're going for? Um, yeah. And particularly if you're going for really large accounts, uh, email outreach SaaS. Okay, email outreach SaaS. So something. So let's assume it's got something like uh, it's something like Outreach IO, Sales Loft, uh, Sales Sales View, something something like that. So yeah. uh, a cadencing tool. Um, so uh, let's let's dig into the question a bit. Sorry, Stefan, I jumped on top of you. You go ahead. No, I would say uh, at least if you're like in the, this larger deal size where like things is going to take a long time and you're going to be spending a lot of money just to get a few deals in, the list that you're running your ads on, I like get the named list of accounts, is not something you create in marketing in a silo. At best, the sales team would help uh, make the list. They would like name those 100 accounts or the 1,000 accounts or whatever we're talking about here and then once that they have approved and committed to that list being the right list then you can go out to to linkedin afterwards and start running ads towards the list but you shouldn't be be doing it just in your own little silo it needs to be approved that that, that literally the 100 or 1000 companies needs to be approved by the sales team yeah so i i just add to that so like um so I've so anna got back and said she's working with lamb list lampire um, so yeah, like, okay, just, just to do, let's, let's take these guys as an example, right? So if I was to come in tomorrow as, um, as like a, a marketer or marketing advisor or CMO or something along those lines to lend this, what would probably I say? a pretty good fit for your skills, even so, or you know, potentially, that potentially, potentially. Yeah. So <laughs> let's, let, let's put me on the spot here and see what I do. Right. So, yeah. so first off, it, it, Stefan sort of hit it there as well with your target account list. So first and foremost, have you created your TAM, your total addressable market? Yes or no? Okay. If you haven't, then let's go create your TAM. Let's go figure out what are all the companies in which we want to do business with. Okay. Um, we then typically, I then typically break those down into a couple of different tiers. So tiers are normally done based on revenue. So I would say uh, revenue size of the company X, revenue, revenue size, that's our tier one. Highest revenue, mid-tier revenue, tier two, tier three is lowest, right? Sorry. Um, so I, I I think with that you need to you need to you, you need to create your list, right? Then with each of those lists, you say, okay, for tier one, what is the value of those companies to us as an organization? So uh, let's take, for example, like if they're multi-million dollar organizations, then in terms of giving us value back, let's say multi is probably too much, but if we're talking about a 100K contract a year, something along those lines, then it's going to give you a certain amount of budget that you're going to be able to play with to go target those particular accounts. Do the same with tier one, tier two, tier three. Um, then what you need to be doing is with your sales team is, is aligning with them on plays against each of those different tiers. And then there's also alignment with the sales leadership to make sure that there's some form of like outreach approach across each one of those tiers. So which accounts are owned by which reps? Do you have enterprise size reps? Do you have reps that are focused on the mid-market? Do you have reps that are focused on smaller accounts? So in that in that example, you might have an enterprise market mar, uh, enterprise rep. You might have a mid-market rep, and then tier three goes to uh, goes to um, goes to the SDRs, right? I was going to say the kids, the S the SDRs, <laughs> right? Um, and they just focus on those, right? So um, 
with that, then you're able to come up with plays to, to try to break through the noise into those accounts. So tier ones, you might create your own events, for example, which you invite tier ones to, which could be dinners, et cetera. Mm, right? right. So this goes to your channel question. Uh, Ina is like, okay, if we, if we have tier one and we're going after tier one, then we say, um, we say, okay, like uh, for that, we can afford to do like something a bit more special or put together like a special direct mail piece, which is going to go into those tier one accounts to try to gain traction for the sellers. And you're, you're aligning with the sellers in that by saying, Hey, look guys, like this is the message that we were thinking for this particular play that we're going to go out against these particular accounts. Do you agree with it? And what we're going to do is as well, guys, we're also going to target these same accounts with, on LinkedIn with very specific messaging for those specific accounts. We're then going to feed back information back to you, which is data from LinkedIn showing how many impressions are being served onto those accounts, how many interactions are being served onto each individual account. And then you can then go and follow up with those as needs be, right? So you're sort of like working together a little bit on that, right? And if I look at like, for example, in Lemlist's perspective, I'm just looking at your pricing model here. So your pricing model is, Okay, you also have like an enterprise, uh, an enterprise size account or an enterprise size uh, size um, pricing model, but like let's say that the majority of your deals come in from email outreach and sales engagement, which are fifty dollars a seat per month and eighty three dollars a seat per month. So that's like more or less volume SaaS there. So my guess is that like you probably have some form of let's take that let's let's take the like the higher higher end value of those deals that you might be bringing in. I think that exercise that I mentioned before in building the TAM is still a useful thing for you to do. We did the same thing at Lead Feeder, and we did have outbound sales teams that were then focusing on those specific accounts that were in there. And then as well as that, you were also then bringing in some of the ones that would be coming in via inbound anyway, which would be signing up to the free trial, but they're mostly focused on via the Google perspective when you're bringing them in over via Google. So I'm very wary, Stefan, that I've spoken gone on a rampage now for the past i don't know three minutes so <laughs> please uh jump in no i think it's really good and it's the same like you do like these custom vip events but the same thing when you look at the year and not planning on okay which events should we actually attend um you know write down the ones you would suggest go check with the sales team whether they think it the right kind of events <laughs> and it's like it's this constant ping pong between the two departments yeah if marketing want to go organize several different uh, trade shows make sure that the, those trade shows actually align with the ones that the, the sales team want to be be selling to uh, sure. afterwards the same thing if you're the one sitting on your google search ads account well like once a year or once a quarter go show, show somebody in sales which keywords are you buying <laughs> do they those keywords actually resonate with what the sales team would expect or is, are you running in a completely different direction here yeah i think i think in in your case as well like if you're selling a volume SaaS product i think the the um the air the it it it, it gets a bit trickier to do much like broader testing right because your your customer acquisition costs need to remain pretty low and normally a very like high performance channel is normally google uh for driving free trial signups and it, most companies, most companies that I've worked with and most companies that I've consulted with in volume SaaS are not using Google to the best of its of the best of its ability. So Aina, my guess would be, and we, you can follow up with me separately on this. If you want to ping me on LinkedIn, you can find me. But I, I, I would imagine that you may not be using Google to the best of its ability. Your content engine is maybe not working as well as it could be, right? Because you, what you want to be seeing is over time, signups becoming more from organic that takes time to build it though so you're, you'll have your your paid your paid stuff up here and organic down here and then that will start to overtake or start to level out with one another in terms of in terms of number of uh, of, of of free trials coming in hmm. um but when it comes when it comes to then trying additional channels for free trial signups just be very wary of like not go, of going down like the linkedin route and getting people to Maybe go direct to free trial via LinkedIn is not going to work. I'll tell you that now, it's not going to work. <laughs> um, also, also be careful that you're not blowing your customer acquisition costs by going targeting people with eBooks uh, with low value accounts on LinkedIn because what's going to happen is it's going to cost you 70 euros for that click or that lead. Uh, they're going to come in and your customer acquisition cost for that one particular customer is probably going to be somewhere in the region of $2,000 because once you take into account the cost of 
took for them to download that thing, plus all the outreach that needs to happen afterwards in order to get them up to a place where they're warm enough to turn into a customer, your payback period is two years or four years or whatever, right? So it's stop and make a sense. So in your case, in the exact LEM list example here, go after your enterprise customers by building that TAM of enterprise customers. The other ones I'd be looking at trying to bring in more via, uh, via Google paid and getting that as working as efficient as possible. And then also um, second off on the, um, uh, on via organic by really doubling down on content strategy and doubling up on that content engine. Yeah. It's funny, like to hear your anecdotes uh, about uh, like collecting leads from from LinkedIn. I've uh, I've burned my hands. <laughs> Similarly, I've tried going for like you know, book a demo now to somebody who've never heard about us. I've also tried to like create a ebook that is just like very like squeezing upon what we're doing, but still far from. Nothing came out of that either. And then I think actually now we've kind of given up on this kind of lead uh, conversion way of doing it. So we I just run like a matched account list and just mm-hmm. run all sorts of different kinds of content on top of it instead. And then hopefully they yeah. show up at our doorstep at uh, at some point then. Yeah, brand. So LinkedIn yeah. is awesome for brand. All those ebook downloads, all that type of stuff is all brand. It's not like it's not performance. It's not driving people, especially in volume SaaS, if you're getting people to sign up for a demo. Like uh, what you need to be doing is drive them to the, or sign up for a, for a free trial even. Like what you want to be doing is get them to the free trial page, but the only place you're going to be able to really do that from is from Google. You know, yeah. that's uh, whether it's true organic or whether it's true uh, yeah. or Bing, for example, Bing is coming up in the world. So uh, would you, it's, it's still not never going to be as popular as Google, but yeah. And cool, I hope right? that answered that question for you. Yeah, um, I think it was really good, Andy. Um, so we're already past the, the 30 minutes, which I think is what we we, we promised you up front. Um, so if, is there anything on this topic you feel like you, you haven't said yet that people should uh, should know? No, I think, again, it's not rocket science. It's, build, it's relationship building, right? And again, like I would always say that it's most important to have the marketers push it so that it's actually happening because sellers will not be the ones to push that relationship. And you need to build that mm-hmm. relationship. You need to double down on it. Go buy them a beer, as Stefan said, you know. That, yeah. I mean, it helps. It helps massively, right? So I, I, go and talk. Like, communicate. Talk to one another. It's the most important thing. Wonderful. All right. Uh, Andy, you did mention your URL during uh, this conversation, but if people want to talk more with you after this, what should they do? LinkedIn. Just get me on LinkedIn. Andy Culligan, C-U-L-L-I-G-A-N. Uh, I didn't say my second name in here. I should have done that. Um, so, so um, yeah, you can you can get me on LinkedIn. You can visit my website, andyculligan.com. Um, yeah. Just reach out if you need anything. Wonderful. Andy, thank you so much for, for joining and sharing your like uh, war stories with us. Sure. No worries, Stefan.